Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vladimir Chuk. I'm Executive Director, International Disability Alliance. And it is my greatest pleasure to welcome you to the, to the Civil Society Forum as a part of the, of the Conference of States Parties number 15. We would like to welcome you to the virtual Civil Society Forum once again. And we have a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, uh, live capturing uh, can, can be find can be found in the external li link that 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 you can find in a chat box so go to the chat box it is just now there and you can uh, you can click on that link to have a live uh, live a live captioning secondly we have a french and spanish translation uh, which can be used by by clicking on a, on a globe icon at the bottom of the zoom zoom screen. So please select uh, your language be, between Spanish, English, and French, so that 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 you will not be hearing the different different voices on the screen. Thank you very much. So, like I said, this is a part of the Conference of States Parties number fifteen. And, and we have very packed and very interesting civil society forum this year. And the first session is especially interesting. It deals with, uh, with development, uh, with international development. It is, it is critical that we start with this conversation because we are in a very uh, historical moment and not, and not really in a good way, one can say. We are coming into the third year of the pandemic and we are hoping to see the end of this uh, pandemic eventually, and we are starting to see the glimpses of uh, glimpses of the light. However, we are also faced as a world with the, with the war in the Ukraine, with with many refugees, and the generally financial crisis that is re uh, directly resulting from the previous two uh, catastrophes. So. Uh, in these kinds of scenarios, world leaders typically tend to tend to forget about disability, tend to deprioritize their commitments and the investment in disability. So here we are once again to strongly recom recommend and to strongly remind them that that they need to stay the stay the course. That now it is uh, more important than uh, than ever to recommit and to to make sure that CRPD will be implemented everywhere and, and for all persons with disabilities equally. We will, we, will, we will hear much more from the uh, distinguished speakers, but my job now next is to just introduce the moderator uh, and that will be guiding us to, to, through the first panel. Her name is Hawa Ojeifo, and she's a founder of the organization She Writes Women from for, from Nigeria. Hawa, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, distinguished guests. Thank you so much uh, to International Disability Alliance for having me here. Um, can I confirm that I that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, see you, everything. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, so today um, for this panel, obviously, we'll be hearing from um, several speakers, and I'd like to introduce um, four of the speakers today. First, um, Mr. Yanis Varadakastenis who is the Chair International Disability Alliance, the President of the European Disability Forum. And throughout his life, he has been an active disability rights campaigner. Since 2007, he has been the European Disability Forum representative on the on IDA board. After the IDA elections of 2021, he holds the office of the IDA President. Um, also on this, uh, the panel of speakers today, we have His Excellency Mr. Juka, 
Zalovara. I apologize if I have gotten any of the names wrong. Um, who is the permanent state secretary of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and president of the conference. His Excellency has worked for the Finnish Foreign Ministry for nearly 25 years, was recently named the Permanent State Secretary of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and this is his second year serving as the president of the Conference of State Parties. Ms. Rosemary Kate Kayes, I apologize, is the chair of the CRPD committee, and um, she is an Australian human rights lawyer, disability rights activist, researcher, and academic. She's a senior research fellow at the University of New South Wales, the Faculty of Law, and the chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, having contributed to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2004. Um, KS has also been the director of several non-governmental organizations throughout her career, advocating for disability rights, and implementation of the UN Convention in Australia and abroad. And lastly, we have Dr. Joseph Moore, who is the president, World Federation of the Deaf. Dr. Joseph J. Moore is the Secretary General of the International Disability Alliance and the president of the World Federation of the Deaf. Joseph has worked with governments, NGOs, and disability communities in over 50 different countries in his two decades of involvement with international human rights work. Thank you so much to all, um, to all our speakers today, um, where we will be talking about working together for the rights of persons with disabilities, international cooperation, in line with the CRPD's Article 32. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, um, Halva, for sort of uh, in, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, uh, Vladimir, for opening. And um, it's really good to uh, connect uh, back with the uh, UN uh, community. It is my pleasure to be part of the opening session of the uh, COSP15 uh, Civil Society Forum. Firstly, I want to thank the International uh, Disability Alliance for the kind invitation and organizing this important event. I will also take this opportunity to thank Ida for great cooperation during Finland's two-year presidency of the Conference of State Parties uh, to the CRPD. Your insight, contribution and efforts are highly valued. We hope the cooperation with the upcoming bureaus will remain very active in uh, future uh, conferences. Uh, as for Finland, uh, promoting the rights of persons with disabilities is a priority and a cross-cutting issue. We are strongly committed uh, to including persons with disabilities in all what we do, from human rights, peace and security issues, to development cooperation and humanitarian action. We have made a commitment to anchor our policies firmly in the rights of persons with disabilities, namely through making CRPD compliant policies, standards and guidance both nationally and internationally. In decision making processes in general, one key issue is unfortunately, unfortunately often forgotten inclusion of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations in all stages of the process. In order to fulfill the promise of leaving no one behind, this is of utmost importance. We can realize benefits that international cooperation aims to bring for persons with disabilities only by mutually planning, implementing and evaluating needs and rights uh, of persons with disabilities. Uh, the best way to work on this is to ensure equal, meaningful and full participation of persons with disabilities in all uh, stages of planning of international cooperation. Knowledge and expertise of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations should always be harnessed in all activities. 
Therefore, I want to underline that the principle of participation of persons with disabilities really is a key for successful policies. In concrete terms, this could mean having persons with disabilities actively participating and con consulting them so that policies and programs done through international cooperation will implement the rights of persons with disabilities and take the needs of persons with, with disabilities into consideration. This will lead to better, diverse and more disability inclusive solutions. Finally, evaluation is the only way to make sure that the rights of persons with disabilities have been correctly addressed in international cooperation, whether we are talking about a development cooperation, climate action, or responding to humanitarian disasters. If planning and implementation of international cooperation in those contexts has been disability inclusive and participatory, respecting the rights of persons with disabilities is expected to be successful, but the only way to make sure of this is again the participation of persons with disabilities in the monitoring and, um, and evaluation. Uh, the Russian Federation aggression in Ukraine has placed almost 3 million persons with disabilities at risk. When it comes to persons with disabilities, it is deeply worrying that the fate of many persons with disabilities in Ukraine is unknown. Many are reported to be trapped or abandoned in their homes without access to basic needs, services or information on how to flee to safety. Many are simply left just, just left behind in many different ways. The convention requires states to take all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of people with disabilities in situation of risk including armed conflict and humanitarian emergencies. Effective uh, international cooperation should and can play a meaningful part in bringing humanitarian assist assistance to those, those in need. States, parties, organizations of persons with disabilities, humanitarian agencies, among others, should work together. I hope this, will, this week will shed further light on how to realize the rights of persons with disabilities better in the future. This week feeds into the promise of the international community to leave no one behind. I wish you fruitful discussions and warmly welcome you to participate actively uh, in the Conference of State Parties this week. Your expertise, knowledge and participation is highly valued. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Uh, so many points. Ensuring we have equal and meaningful participation. Um, ensuring also, which is really important, that um, the expertise of persons with disabilities are included in the entire process of the planning, implementation and evaluation, which will ultimately lead to better diverse disability inclusion. And of course, the highlighting as to what is working for people with um, disabilities. And of course, um, you know, the call to action really being for all state parties to work together to realize the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities. Once again, thank you very much, His Excellency, Mr. Juca Salubara, who is the Permanent State Secretary of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and the President of the conference. I'd like to hand the floor over to Mr. Yanis Vardakastanis, who is the Chair International Disability Alliance, the President's European Disability Forum. And like I said earlier, since 2007, he has been the European Disability Forum representative on the IDA board. And after the IDA elections of 2000 um, 21, he holds the office of the IB president. Over to you, sir. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Honorable Secretary of State of Finland, Honorable Chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Honorable President of the Europe, of the Federation, World Federation of Deaf, 
dear colleague Joseph Mori. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today. We have some very important issues to discuss during today's civil society forum prior to the opening of the 15th course this year. Certainly, since the last civil society forum, many important developments have taken place. New challenges, but also new achievements have taken place. All in all, we are working in a new environment already touched on by the previous speaker. Our work, of course, is unfinished. We need to work on um, uh, creating a new disability movement, in my opinion. We have new challenges. We have new goals even to achieve. And our movement needs to be ambitious. It's not enough to just remind the leaders of the governments of the international or regional institutions. We need to advocate and to advocate strongly. For example, last year, to start with a very positive development, we saw the launch of the We The 15 campaign, which aims to be the biggest ever human rights campaign to promote the respect and implementation of the rights of persons with disabilities, 1.2 billion people worldwide. But also we have seen that COVID-19 have brought to us new challenges. And we have understood very painfully that um, we may have thought in the um, past that we were reaching the realization of our rights. But the pandemic, as I said, has brought to us very painful situations for persons with disabilities in many parts of the world, from the most developed to the developing. We are also seeking to be better prepared. And this is very important, to be better prepared for our people around the world for situations of this kind. We are organizing ourselves. We have seen what is happening in Ukraine. The previous speaker referred to that. And the International Civility Alliance with our members, we are preparing an answer. And our answer is, to initiate, to take the initiative for a disability inclusive in emergency response mechanism to fill a gap in coordination to enhance disability inclusion in emergency response and coordination. We are calling for more participation in decision making around climate change at all levels. And last year, for the first time, there was an official delegation of representatives, organizations of persons with disabilities that participated in COP26. And we are preparing now for the 
COP27. And realizing these ambitions requires capacity building and of course, financial and institutional resources. We know that 80% of us of persons with disabilities live in developing countries and the work in that part of the world has to be the priority of our agenda at global level. Our participation in decisions on COVID response, disaster risk reduction, and humanitarian action is deeply intertwined with um, international cooperation. It is a critical component in the flow of these resources. Some governments, bilateral organizations and networks, including the GLAD network, are already investing in um, disability inclusive development and humanitarian response to support our movement in its work. Under the CRPD, states parties have a very strong obligation to ensure that efforts for international cooperation, including international development programs are inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities. With this session, we are seeking to highlight this obligation and explore what it means in practice in this period. I wish us all a great success of this year's Civil Society Forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yanis Varda Castanis, who is the chair of the International Disability Alliance. Thank you very much. Um, some of the things that I hear from your remarks are the fact that there is a, this is a new environment and the work is unfinished. We need to create a new disability movement entirely due to the new challenges that are being faced. Um, some of the challenges like you highlighted are the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, you, you, you have rightly said that uh, it's, it's no longer just about reminding, but we need to strongly advocate you talked about more participation in decision making around climate change as well, and just generally ensuring that disaster risk humanitarian action is disability inclusive, because these are deeply intertwined and critical components of the flow of resources and international cooperation. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to hand the floor over to Ms. Rosemary Caius, who is the chair of the CRPD committee and uh, she's an Australian human rights lawyer, disability rights advocate, researcher, and academic. She's the senior research fellow. She is a senior research fellow at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Law and the chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, over to you, Ms. Kyrus. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'd like to thank the Civil Society Coordination Mechanism for the opportunity to participate in this first session of the 2022 Virtual Civil Society Forum. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is the first human rights treaty to set out binding obligations on states relating to international cooperation. 
between and among states, Article 32, international cooperation, has particular relevance at the moment for technical and economic assistance and international development programs that are being provided in response to situations of risk, such as the COVID pandemic, and in response to humanitarian emergencies, such as the war in Ukraine, which will no doubt feature in discussions today and during COST. The Convention is the specialist law for people with disabilities. It provides the principles and the standards which need to underpin a human rights approach to international cooperation. A critical convention principle and standard is the requirement for close consultation and active involvement of persons with disabilities through their representative organisations in the implementation and monitoring of the convention international cooperation planning and implementation by states parties and other stakeholders needs to include people with disabilities and not only in those efforts that pertain to people with disabilities, but in all areas of international cooperation, such as those relating to gender, age and poverty, a human rights approach to international cooperation is disability inclusive. These efforts should also be informed by rigorous disability inclusive research methods for the collection of disaggregated data and a robust evidence base. The Convention also requires states parties to take into account the multi-dimensional layers of identity and statuses of individuals for its implementation. States parties need to consider the specific measures that need to be identified and implemented to respond to the diversity of people with disabilities, such as the specific needs of women and girls, children, indigenous peoples, people from and people from different ethnic, cultural and linguistic groups. Article 32 also requires states parties to consider how all other rights are applied in international cooperation. This means that states need to implement their actions in a way that ensures all human rights are fulfilled Action should not diminish the rights of people with disabilities. They should facilitate these rights. Measures need to respect, protect, and fulfill all rights, such as the right to life, to education, to health, to work, to liberty and security, to freedom from exploitation, violence and abuse, and to adequate standard of living. This annual forum has always been a place for the global disability rights movement to network, share information, exchange ideas and coordinate efforts in preparation for the Conference of States Parties. Although I need to leave about now to participate in this side event, I look forward to hearing about the outcomes of your discussions today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosemary Fez, the chair of the CRPD committee. Thank you so much for sharing your input. Uh, we hear you now declare, reiterating the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine as um, events that have exacerbated humanitarian responses to persons with psychosocial or disabilities generally. Um, you also talk about human rights approach to international cooperation close involvement of persons with disability. Um, you also go ahead and mention the different um, you know, groups, ethnic groups, age, cultures, uh, the rights they leave to work, but most importantly, calling on states parties to share information, exchange ideas, 
for the realization of the rights of persons with disabilities. Once again, thank you very much, Ms. Rosemary Kares. All right, uh, moving on finally to Dr. Joseph Murray, who is the president of World Federation of the Deaf. And he is the Secretary General of the International Disability Alliance and the president of the World Federation of the, of the Deaf. He has worked with government NGOs, disability communities in over 50 different countries. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, good morning to members of the panel. Many of you have mentioned COVID, and of course COVID has changed how we have actively engaged and collaborated on an international level. And we can see some of those collaborations continuing. For example, in WFD, the World Federation of the Deaf, our engagement with our 131 members has changed we've been much more interactive in terms of developing our digital strategies to ensure people are included. We've had much more partnership with governments and international NGOs. This new work has allowed us to ensure that there's been greater information sharing with the goal of making sure that there is the full implementation of the convention, CRPD. One of the key main aims of our member organisations is of Article 21 to make sure that sign language is recognised and promoted in public life. 60% of the signatories of the convention globally so far have not taken basic steps towards the implementation of Article 21 in spite of their ratification. This is a significant right that is missing in Africa and Asia and the Asia Pacific. There are very few countries which ensure that sign language is legally recognised. The WFD works in partnership with our member organisations to try and ensure that governments understand their commitments and the importance of promoting and ensuring that Article 21 is enacted so that sign languages are promoted globally. We've seen wonderful uh, training conducted in Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines and Ghana to that effect. We have powerful international networks, and one example of this is within the European deaf communities towards the, in, after the invasion of Ukraine. We were able to use our global networks of experts to ensure that we released a statement of policies for the protection of people in armed conflict, a week after the first Russian forces crossed into Ukraine. Our national organisations on the countries bordering Ukraine have worked closely with our member organisations in Ukraine, UTOG, for the start, from the start to ensure deaf refugees uh, were supported to get to countries to enable appropriate humanitarian help and aid from the very beginning. This included contact with deaf communities and information in Ukrainian and international sign. UTOG shows the strong value of OPD's assistance when they're recognised by national governments. They're able to not only provide materials, but also real-time statistics on the number of say, displaced deaf peoples and their needs. UTOG shows that the value of OPDs in the most dire humanitarian situations is important. So direct collaboration with deaf communities is important. Another area of focus for us and our members is coming to a common understanding of inclusive education of all learners and how this can be implemented for deaf learners specifically. The WFD recently held our fourth international conference online to address the issue with our members and to bring forward the IDA's global research on inclusive education. This report was a major effort on cross-disability collaboration, representing the unified views of IDA's eight global and six regional members. The report makes it clear inclusive education requires system-wide change to ensure learning is accessible for all learners. 
As part of this change, schools for deaf children are to be supported in becoming inclusive multilingual schools in the national sign languages, ensuring deaf learners can learn alongside other deaf children and other signers in educational settings where the national sign languages are widely used across the school. Last week, I was in Ghana at a meeting organised by our national member, the National Association of the Deaf in Ghana, to meet the heads of nine country, countries, uh, 16 schools for deaf learners, across the representative, alongside representatives from national umbrella organisations for PWDs and the Governmental Office for Educational Services to share the highlights of this global report. Going forwards, it's important that we make sure that we deliver international collaboration. And this is by making sure that uh, NGOs, international NGOs and governments work together to support sign language. And that's included in budgetary measures to ensure from the get go, sign language is prioritised and that people use sign language in public, interpreting services are uh, used in public. And this is something which needs to happen on an international level. We saw the collaboration happen in Ghana last week, but we can also, we've also seen the activities surrounding the Ukraine invasion, but we need to make sure that these works continue across a variety of different issues that Im impact deaf people and disabled people. These dialogues are an important part of country governments ensuring that they meet their commitments in re with respect to Article 21. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. John Murray, who is the Joseph, Dr. Joseph Murray, sorry, um, who is the president of the World Federation of the Deaf. Um, once again, highlighting the impact of COVID-19, um, but also expressing um, more partnerships with governments and international NGOs, as well as inclusive education um, with regards to sign language. I'd like to hand over the floor to Ms. Beravi Davar, who is the Executive Director of Transforming Communities for Inclusion for the first dialogue session. Over to you, Beravi. Um, thank you so much, Paua. Um, can you feedback me if I'm audible and all is well with my system? I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, so good morning. My name is Bhargavi Dawa. I represent TCI and also the Global Coalition for Deinstitutionalization, which is GCDI for short. The Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization was initiated to support the work of the CRPD committee in the drafting of a guidelines on deinstitutionalization in the post-COVID area um, arena, so that. Uh, uh, to, uh, and to ensure the full and effective participation of OPDs um, in the guidelines, uh, development of the guidelines. So the GCDI um, has been uh, working for almost a year now. And the, as many of you will know, the guidelines were just released. GCDI is a partnership of six organizations, both OPDs and civil society, including IDA, ENIL, TCI, Inclusion International, Validity Foundation, Disability Rights International, Center for Human Rights, Pretoria, DRF, and DRAF. Uh, we are very grateful for this opportunity for uh, bringing out this amazing, supporting the committee in bringing out this amazing guidelines draft for OPDs and other um, stakeholders to engage with um, and feedback on uh, by the end of this month. The COVID Disability Rights Monitoring Report brought out by civil society organizations in 2020, highlighted the extraordinary hazards and horrors of institutionalization on persons with disabilities, especially during emergency situations. The CRPD committee expressed strong concern and responded by setting up a working group on deinstitutionalization in 2020. Uh, there has been the question, there is a full general comment five on independent living and inclusion and a general comment one on legal capacity. 
among many other general comments, um, special rapture reports, so on and so forth. So is a guideline still necessary? However, GC5 and other associated documents have not been enough for national policies to move in the direction of independent living and inclusion. For example, legal harmonization has not been done of incapacity laws, laws for institutions which cover for disability-based detention, such as the mental health laws, they have not been touched anywhere in the world. In fact, they are growing in number um, in the global south. Segregated settings for persons with disabilities are becoming also more in number. They are becoming more diverse in their format. They are becoming more inclusive of all kinds of populations, issue of children and in institutions, of autistic persons, the elderly, and so on, other than a wide range of constituencies of persons with disabilities. The CRPD committee uh, uh, completing the work of the working group released the draft guidelines for DI consultations about two weeks ago. The DI guidelines gives governments and international cooperation agencies the assurance of the feasibility and practicality of living in the community and gives strong guidance against spending more on institutions in the future in all their forms. We invite all OPDs and civil society agencies, different multi-stakeholders to engage fully with this consultative process uh, and to feed back uh, the committee uh, by June 30th. Yeah, so um, I now welcome all the speakers. We have uh, Tina Minkovic from, uh, from CRUSP, Yani Rosa Damayanti from IMHA Indonesia, and Nadia Haddad from Enel, they have done decades to spotlight the human rights violations of institutionalization. Um, and uh, we invite each of them to share in about two minutes a little bit about themselves and how the topic of deinstitutionalization speaks to them in their work. So over to you, Tina. Thank you, Bhargavi. Um, my name is Tina Minkowitz, president of the Center for the Human Rights of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. Um, I was involved in the, in the drafting and negotiations of the convention back in the period from 2002 to 2006. And even at that time, I was focusing on everything that was going to be needed to abolish the system of forced and coerced psychiatric interventions and detention in that system. And that includes universal legal capacity um, for its own sake and also to guarantee the elimination of those forced practices. I am myself a survivor of institutionalization and take it very much to heart that right now we we are closer by putting out these draft guidelines, which will then be issued in final form, to actually taking the steps to, to make it a reality, to eliminate the institutions, all the kinds of institutions, including all of the mental health settings where a person can be deprived of their liberty. I think that's all for me. Thank you. And I think we, I don't, yeah, you will move. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tina. Now I invite Yani Rosa Damayanti from, the, uh, from Indonesia to introduce herself. I don't see any in the panelists. Um, so uh, I now request Nadia Haddad to introduce herself while we wait for Yani Rosa to join the panelists. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good day to all of you. So my name is Nadia Haddad. I'm the co-chair of uh, the European Network on Independent Living. We are a user-led network of disabled people with members for whole Europe. We represent the disability movement for human rights and social inclusion based on solidarity, peer support, digitalization, democracy, self-representation, 
cross disability and self determination. So um, myself, I had an accident uh, a few years ago, and I was on a waiting list as I refused to go in institution. So I was institutionalized in my own apartment. And from that angle, I am happy to join this very important topic with you today. Thanks a lot, Nadia. Um, I don't see any here yet. So we will carry on uh, while Yeni joins us. Okay, there she is. Yeni, uh, may I request you to introduce yourself in two minutes and uh, share how this topic speaks to you, the topic of deinstitutionalization. So my apologies, I think we will um, carry on. Yeni may be having some difficulties with, um, with technology and who doesn't. <laughs> so um, my question to Tina is, you know, national legislations worldwide have struggled with little success in harmonizing legislations to repeal disability-based detention and incapacity laws. And disability-based detention and incapacity laws, as you know, comes in a variety of forms and formats around the world. Attempts in the past to deinstitutionalize have failed in protecting human rights of persons leaving institutions who get entangled after their you know, release in a web of unfavorable legal provisions, making community life quite impossible. Do you think having a different perspective on the DI framework, which is what the DI guidelines is attempting to do, as you mentioned, DI guidelines is actually giving practical steps how we can move this agenda forward towards inclusion. Will it help to bring about safer and inclusive lives? Um, over to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Bhargavi. Um, I would like to frame my remarks by talking about a reparations approach to deinstitutionalization, which is, is a way to characterize the overall approach of the guidelines. A reparations approach to deinstitutionalization means that we understand institutionalization to be a profound and complex violation of a person's human rights. It includes arbitrary detention, torture and other ill treatment, denial of legal capacity, denial of an adequate standard of living, denial of the right to home and family life and more. Deinstitutionalization has to fulfill human rights by stopping the violations, changing law and policy framework so that violations do not recur and working with survivors of institutionalization to repair the harms they have experienced individually and collectively. A reparations approach contrasts with previous attempts at deinstitutionalization that merely shifted services to the community or that returned people to their families. Those initiatives centered service providers or non-disabled family members and did not make communities fully accessible and welcoming. Moreover, previous deinstitutionalization processes did not acknowledge that institutionalization is a moral and legal wrong and did not acknowledge the scope and extent of harms caused by institutionalization. As Bhargavi mentioned, those initiatives created new forms of institutionalization that were wrongly viewed as acceptable ways to include people with disabilities in the community, such as short-term involuntary hospitalization, community treatment orders, and forms of housing under the control of service providers where people do not have the rights and privileges we associate with simply being in one's own home. 
These failures compounded the harm over time for all survivors. We have been denied a social reckoning, a space to grieve our losses, and the possibility of reconnecting with those who harmed us or who stood by as we were harmed on a basis of reconciliation that respects our dignity and self-worth. It is most egregious for the vast many of us who are subjected to repeat institutionalizations that compound the harm exponentially, especially when forced medication with harmful mind altering drugs impairs cognition and creativity, causes permanent damage to physical health and shortens the lifespan. Without social and legal reckoning and the possibility of true moral reconciliation, it is difficult for survivors of institutionalization to flourish. We are required to adapt to an ableist world that blames us for its own failures. We need reparations to move on together and to individually and collectively heal from serious discrimination and mistreatment. The draft deinstitutionalization guidelines take a reparations approach by centering persons who are institutionalized or have been institutionalized as rights holders, fully entitled to legal capacity, liberty, and participation in making policy and law regarding deinstitutionalization and its implementation. The guidelines furthermore call for the creation of a reparations mechanism and apply the requirements of international law to reparation for institutionalization. The forms of reparation set out in international law are satisfaction, guarantees of non-repetition, restitution, rehabilitation, and compensation. Satisfaction includes the cessation of violations. There can be no reconciliation while abuse is still taking place. It also includes an apology negotiated, by, negotiated with survivors, among other things. Guarantees of non-repetition are addressed primarily by changing laws and policies so that institutionalization can no longer be carried out. Restitution means restoring anything taken away from the person that can be restored, legal capacity, liberty, property, opportunities for work and schooling that were cut short. Rehabilitation means providing the legal and social services that people need to establish themselves in communities and to address health needs caused by institutionalization. Compensation should be at levels adequate to dignify the immediate and consequential harms experienced by survivors. Thank you. Back to you, Bargavi. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, there is the advocacy position uh, emerging that if we do a lot of community inclusion works, then the framework of law will change for persons with disabilities. Um, however, what we have seen in communities is that the legal barriers uh, that uh, Tina is, is talking about and many of us have talked about in terms of legal capacity um, and institutionalization, until the legal barriers are removed, uh, community life for persons with disabilities and other vulnerable groups, uh, such as the LGBTQI community, the, the trans communities, uh, face a lot of uh, involuntary commitments. Uh, the indigenous people, um, you know, the question of race, all of that uh, will constantly, the, their community lives will constantly be interrupted by the force of law. Um, so it's really important that uh, disability communities advocacy worldwide um, and also different other stakeholders who are working uh, with, uh, with justice system, access to justice, topics like this, and also community inclusion, consider uh, options for legal reform in a, in a more universal way to allow community life to continue without interruption. Um, I see that Yeni Rosa Damayanti from Indonesia joined us. I invite Yeni Rosa now 
to take a few moments to introduce yourself, Yani. And then uh, the question to you is, you've been passionately advocating for deinstitutionalizing de de persons from social care institutions in Indonesia. And you have been spectacular in mobilizing different departments of uh, the national government towards an intersectoral working group on deinstitutionalization. You have also over the years strongly mobilized the national human rights mechanisms for supporting the process. Can you share a little bit about the work focusing on commitments from different departments and the NHRI machinery, uh, the different stakeholders you engage with, for example, the women's movement and the other human rights movement? And what do you see as the future of DI in Indonesia? How will the guidelines help you uh, better to do this? Um, thank you so much, Yeni. Uh, hello, Bargafi. Can you uh, hear my voice? Hello. Can you yes, hear my voice? We, yes, we can hear you, Yeni Rosa. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, my name is Yeni Rosa Damayanti. I'm chair of Indonesian uh, Mental Health Association. This is the first um, organization of persons with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia, and we focus on the advocacy. Um, for the right for pers of person with psychosocial disability to live inclusively in the society. Um, to answer your question, uh, yeah, in Indonesia we have uh, tens of thousands of persons who live in what so-called social care institution. This is a non-medical setting um, uh, uh, of institution that is under Ministry of Social Services. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the function is more like a place to dispose, to dispose or confining family members or abandoned people who have psychosocial disabilities. Uh, it's more like a prison. So for years, we have tried to advocate for this social care institution um, um, uh, through the ministries that oversees and is responsible for this institution, which is Ministry of Social Affairs. But it is not successful. The Ministry of Social Affairs in, uh, uh, is the most stigmatizing and backward ministry in Indonesia in terms of its view of person with uh, disabilities, especially person with psychosocial disabilities. So uh, we finally decided to change our advocacy target and advocacy approach from uh, trying to talk and negotiate with Ministry of Social Affairs um, we switch it to the human rights realm or the human rights approach. For that, we need to change the language that we use, the nomenclature that we use. Um, for example, we, uh, we, we started to use the term of deprivation of liberty. We started to use the arbitrary detention, um, you know, to, uh, to, to, uh, to picture the situation of uh, social care institution in Indonesia. Um, with this... Um, so with this new approach, the target of our advocacy is no longer the Ministry of Social Services, but the Ministry of Law and Human Rights and the National Human Rights Institutes in Indonesia. And it is successful. We found it much easier to convince and in, you know, to convince the Ministry of Law and Human Rights and the Human Rights Institute to support our cause. We kind of like cannot talk to Ministry of Social Affairs, but the people within the Ministry of Law and Human Rights, the people within Human Rights Institution understand what we are talking about. The terms that we use, such as deprivation of liberty, arbitrary detention, torture, are familiar to them. So it's easy for them to grasp you know, the, the seriousness of the situation. So the Ministry of, we, 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 we uh, for several, so for about two years, we approached Ministry of Law and Human Rights and finally, uh, Ministry of uh, Law and Human Rights for, formed what so-called working group to respect, to protect, to promote, to enforce, and to fulfill the rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia. This is a working group consisting of 18 cross ministries um, uh, from, different, um, from different sectors um, that have task of making the roadmaps uh, to initiate and to make effort for person with psychosocial disability to live inclusively in the society. This is including uh, all the necessary um, uh, needs that uh, must provide for person with psychosocial disability to be able to live outside of the institution, including the Ministry of 
public housing, um, uh, the Ministry of um, um, Employment, etc., etc. Et so um, um, the this 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 working group cross ministerial uh, cross ministerial working group was launched in last December uh, on uh, December 10th. Um, to celebrate Human Rights Day by the Minister of Law and Human Rights. Well, there's still many steps that we, we must be taken uh, so this working group can, you know, seriously carry out this uh, lot, uh, these huge duties. But this is a very good initiative for our point of view. And this gives hope that the deinstitutionalized de issue will become a concern and become part of the Indonesian government program in the future. Apart from the government, we also embrace National Human Rights Commission uh, and, in, um, and the National Commission of uh, Violence Against Women. These two institutions conducted investigation into social care institutions and made their reports. I, um, we also succeeded in including social, in, social care institutions as one of the, the institutions that are responsible for supervised, uh, supervision by the cooperation for the reduction of torture, which is part of the anti-torture convention system. Um, and uh, another one that we think also very, very important is that how we push the issue of social care institution to become a central issue among the cross-disability movement. This is very important. The cross-disability movement has the same position as us in viewing the uh, social uh, the, uh, the the mental institution as a major problem of violation of human rights of person with disabilities not only person with psychosocial disabilities so um uh, this issue is not only raised by us as a, 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 a psychosocial disability organization but all other disability organization um and then uh, we also move uh, uh, move uh, forward to, in, uh, to involve um, uh, women organization and uh, other human rights groups in Indonesia. So uh, the point is that to make, uh, to make this work, we have to switch our target of advocacy from the social ministry to the ministry of, um, um, of, of uh, law and human rights. And we have to also to modify uh, the word that we use, the term that we use, to fit into the uh, human rights dis discourses. And we also have to look for other allies outside of the traditional allies within the human rights groups. And um, I think this, uh, this, is, uh, this is quite successful, even though this is uh, still in the very early stage, but I think this is a very, uh, very, a very, uh, a very good initiative. And also one of the things that we cannot say that it is very important that a cross disability organization, cross disability movement, uh, we have to reach out to them and make sure that they are they are you know hand in hand um, uh, uh, with us in uh, tackling this issue. Uh, the, uh, the other very strategic groups for us to uh, to, uh, to to get support is the women organization and other human rights organization. I think uh, that's the experience that we have in Indonesia. But I'll give back to you. Thanks a lot, Yeni. That was amazing. I think Yeni's work in Indonesia um, has really led to a national agenda on the institutionalization by uh, roping in commitments from different kinds of ministries, different kinds of departments, other non-government stakeholders, as well as organizations of persons with disabilities. Um, I, there are very many good practices coming from the Global South and, of course, from worldwide, which the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization had the privilege of hearing about. And we hope to hear more and more of those uh, in the coming weeks um, about community support systems and what are the specific and mainstream services that needs to be available in the communities for prevention of deinstitutionalization and of creating a world where institutions will not be needed so much anymore. Um, it's a utopian dream, but for many of us working in the grassroots with many micro actions, uh, this is feasible, practical, and uh, we have been witness to such stories in the process of drafting the guidelines. It's been a pleasure. So I now request um, Inal uh, Nadia, 
Uh, it has been, uh, Enel has been in the forefront of advocacy for deinstitutionalization across constituencies of persons with disabilities and others, as Yanni Rosa very strongly pointed out. This is no longer just about underrepresented groups. There would imaginably be many aspects to ensuring the right to live independently, uh, some of which Yanni Rosa mentioned, including community support systems and access to resources and services. Can you share what has worked to help people continue to live in the community without interruption? What prevents institutionalization, the revolving door phenomenon, trans institutionalization, and so on? So um, over to you, Nadia. So maybe some good uh, initiative that took place, for example, were that some national policy uh, for provision of state-funded peer support services were established in Estonia, for example, and also direct payment models for personal assistance piloted by OPDs directly. And uh, we had some community-based support also, for example, from Greece, where mobile services were developed as a way to ensure access to quality support for people with mental health problems, living in small towns or remote areas. So this prevented institutionalization and ensured for them better quality of life. And another point was also the establishment and development of self-advocate organizations supported financially by the state, for example, in Romania. And it helps that accessible information and trading about their rights were made available to all disabled people. And also it was empowering them for supporting their independency and for the changing the public attitudes towards them. So, uh, but we had also, sadly enough, some, uh, Ali, some facts about the impact of the COVID, for example, that in Slovenia, 81% of the COVID deaths were among care home residents. And in the UK recently, that showed that 60% of the COVID related deaths were persons with disability themselves. And as mentioned in the beginning of the conference, there are similar trends are observed in other crisis situations, including flooding, extreme water related incidents, like in Germany, for example, 12 disabled people drowned in small group homes due to the lack of adapted rescue materials for big groups. So we learned that, uh, that put, put, putting people together and make them more fragile to and uh, having impact when, when disaster risk is there or any other uh, terrible war condition, for example, also. So lack of support may push now, for example, refugees from Ukraine to go to the neighbor countries and they push many of them to go themselves or guided by their family to institutions because of lack of accessible services and support and care uh, for them. But we notice also that one of the biggest consequences of the COVID and the war is that we are going backwards. We are again considered as vulnerable who need to be protected back from actors for social changes to beneficiaries. So governments are asking more money to invest in more very inclusive institutions where they guarantee a good quality of life and freedom to choose. So they made institution fancy and like, for example, having a park in the garden of the institution that is open to the general public or even building a cinema so that people from the neighborhood can come to the new institutions. This is a very dangerous trend that we want to cherry you today because regular people get familiar with, the, with, with being uh, the president of institution and they take it as normal that disabled people are segregated there because they are taking good care about them. So I think that the guidelines coming on the right moment and should, should really have a legal impact and force the member states to implement the institutionalization plans uh, with, with allocated right budget and the time frame in order to prevent violation of the human rights of every disabled person, regardless their support needs. So I can go on for long, but I think we are in lack of time. So we'll leave it to uh, if there are any other questions that we can answer afterwards to make it a little bit interactive. 
Uh, thank you so much, Nadia. I think uh, we're also running out of time. We're already quite late, I should say. Um, so if there are any quick recommendations from each of the panelists um, on advocating for the DI guidelines, you know, how, any, any thoughts at all about how the DI guidelines can help us? Really, uh, I think Yeni's point was really, really strong and Tina's uh, on, on the importance of these guidelines uh, for our future advocacy uh, for the entire disability movement. Uh, for community inclusion to be possible. So any recommendations? Um, and we can start with you, Nadia, and go on to Yanni and Tina. Yeah, uh, can I say something on this? Yes. Yeah, yes. I think it is very important for this document um, to have, uh, uh, to have um, um, uh, a very important position. Um, in the, you know, uh, in, in the national government, especially. Uh, but we have to push this document to be respected. Um, uh, uh, how, how to make this, this document to be respected by, uh, uh, by the national uh, government? This document must be put into a central agenda, for example, like a UPR, uh, like a, um, a Global Disability Summit, for example, and other, other human rights uh, uh, gathering. So that's what uh, what I'm told because without um, you know the strong position of this uh, document politically to have impact on the local national government, then it is hard for us to use the document to to uh, push uh, to pressure our government. Yeah, thank you so much, Yanni. I'll complete maybe. Yeah. So maybe we as DPOs and human rights organizations. Uh, should use those uh, guidelines to verify also where the money goes to uh, private or public money. We need to make campaigns and advocacy to ensure that there is a proper monitoring and complaint system in place to prevent that the funds from deinstitutionalizations go into services which continue to institutionalize disabled people, including by building small group homes or sheltered workspaces. We'll end up with that, I think. Thank you, Nadia. Um, Tina, would you like to come in here? Yeah, um, I would like to make uh, three short points. One, it's really important that people who are survivors of institutionalization, those who are at risk of institutionalization and those who are still living under any form of institutionalization, take a look at the guidelines and send in your comments to the committee. They really want to hear, especially from those who were directly impacted. Two, I think in implementing the guidelines, it's essential to make sure that mental health systems do not somehow get carved out because survivors of the psychiatric forms of institutionalization, in particular people with psychosocial disabilities, have been among the most active in fighting institutionalization. And yet in repeated, repeated attempts, we are seeing that we are often the ones that get left behind and get left out, that governments find a variety of excuses. And part of the reason is the continuing medicalization of psychosocial disability as forms of what they're calling mental illness. I'm not trying to debate what any people use to refer to as a framework for their own needs and their own disability and their own healing, but it's when we get put under the health systems and that gets treated as a medical condition that has to be treated rather than as a disability for which people need social kinds of support, that's when we get excluded. So I want to especially promote the full, full inclusion of people with psychosocial disabilities in all aspects of deinstitutionalization and um, ensuring that uh, that that article, the guidelines on Article 14 in particular are fully respected. I, I just want to make sure people are invited to our side event tomorrow on remedy and reparation for institutionalization, and I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Tina. It's been an amazing panel, and I hope that there is enough uh, information um, and also good feelings for everyone to engage with the uh, DI guidelines. We enjoyed writing it and supporting the committee on, on, on all the processes involved. Uh, we thank you all for being part of the um, Civil Society Forum and enjoy COS 15. Over to you, um, Hawa, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bhagavi, and thank you all to the uh, last dialogue session. It was such an enlightening and deeply, um, you know, deeply enriching session, really. Um, I'd like to inform all participants that we will like to go for a 10 minute break and we will be back to continue with the second dialogue session. Thank you very much, 10 minutes.
Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Ya, ya, lo ya, veo, ya te veo. Okay. Ah, pero apareces como Carlos Ríos Espinosa. Cámbiale el nombre, ¿no? Okay. Cámbiale el nombre. Muy, muy bueno. A ver, pásame. Espera, nada más. I am having technical issues with Brian. Hello, hi, can I help you? This is Gina from IDA. Yes, Gina, this is this is uh, uh, Carlos Rios. I'm supporting Brian. Yes. Uh, but I cannot, uh, apparently I, she cannot turn his camera on. He cannot. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to switch off my camera. Good day. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this interesting and important panel discussion about knowledge sharing for inclusive education in digital classrooms. I'm James Thurston. I'm a vice president for global strategy and development at G3ICT, the global initiative for inclusive ICTs. I'm honored to be moderating this discussion. I'm very pleased to be bringing to you four global leaders and experts, each with, a, I, I think, a really unique and informed perspective on this topic of inclusive education and classrooms. So today we'll be hearing from Dr. Joseph Murray uh, of the World Federation of the Deaf, Dr. Praveena Sukraj Eli, Chief Director of Governance and Compliance at the South Africa Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities. She's also a, a member of the board of CBM for South Africa. Brian Russell of Peru. 
He's an advocate for inclusive education and twice ran for Congress in his home country of Peru before becoming a Human Rights Watch Marca Bristow Fellow. And finally, the fourth discussant is Deanna Stentoff of the World Blind Union. She's the Secretary General. Uh, she's also Vice President of the Danish Association of the Blind. So uh, uh, let's pretty quickly jump right into this conversation, which I think you'll all find really interesting. Uh, because I think even before the global pandemic, we were seeing a, uh, an exciting, I think, an innovative, but not always inclusive digital transformation of education in classrooms. Every other year, my organization, our nonprofit, does an extensive survey and analysis of how well countries around the world are making progress on the technology aspects of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It's called the DARE Index, and all the data and results are available on our our website, uh, g3ict.org. Um, the last time we did the data, we're actually doing the survey and analysis right now. Uh, the most recent data we have is for 2020. We did that survey and, and analysis of 137 countries. And I think just one particularly relevant and unfortunately not positive data point from that survey and analysis on CRPD progress is that just 54% of countries have some kind of policy or law or regulation covering inclusive technology in education. So about half of countries. But even worse, uh, in 2020, we found that just 1% of, of those countries are actually fully implementing their own inclusive education policies. So just half the countries in the world have a policy for inclusive education and technology. Nearly none of them are fully implementing it. Uh, so we have a, a lot of work to do, and we'll start discussing what that might look like uh, as part of this conversation. So to start, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, from your really unique perspective and, and experience base, what's the current state of, of inclusion when it comes to technology in classrooms? And Brian, uh, I'd love to start with you and your perspective. Brian, you're, you're on mute when you're ready. Brian uh, or, or Carlos, uh, we're not hearing Brian. We are asking Brian to unmute himself. Great. Yeah. Perfect, thank so, you. Yeah, Great. Well, well, yo voy a hablar sobre la educación inclusiva en tiempos de pandemia y armas digitales. Yo voy a hablar de la área digital en los tiempos de la pandemia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak about inclusivity. Uh, I'm coming from Peru. This event, it's, it's very, I'm honored to be here, to be present on this event. I think it's a very interesting topic. I'm going to start with we know that since 2019, I think that from my experience, I can say it's very important to speak about this topic. Uh, 
para la estrella de la discapacidad. ¿A dónde quedó? Sigue, 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 Brian. No hay problema. Algunos ya quedaron a abandonar la escuela. En el 2017, el 12% de los estudiantes que... En 2017, uh, only 12% of the students with disability knew. They can only they could only uh, read and write and only 6% went to superior education. The students with uh, disabilities had difficulties to be included in regular classes because of the wrong idea that uh, people had that the people with disabilities held back the other people, the other students. So uh, in uh, Latin America, the situation is uh, similar to two of every 10 persons uh, left studying and uh, everyone in each 10 persons never um, entered the school. This situation is uh, getting more and more preoccupying and it is necessary to take immediate action. The So we want our rights and our uh, autonomy and our rights to be seen. The disability is not inability. We need to be a part of this change and the inclusion needs to be for everyone and it needs to come to everyone. Notwithstanding, uh, not, every, not everyone had the opportunity uh, to enter the schooling uh, on the way they're supposed to. Because of that, I think fundamental uh, to start speaking about the situation in Peru, in my country. We are we uh, we uh, noticed everything that is coming and we need to be prepared uh, in one digitalized era like is ours it's important that the students and professors can enter all the technologies and eliminate all of the breaches that can um, stop people and uh, um, to take classes uh, virtually and presentially. That, that's why my presentations will uh, stop with panoramic here in Peru when it comes to uh, inclusive education and the actions uh, which have been taken. Another topic is uh, the sign language that we still don't have in our schools. So, uh, 
so that people which are deaf can assist classes. In my personal opinion, I think that it is very important that the authorities uh, help uh, helps us a lot with our success, but we also have to take into consideration uh, persons with disabilities. And that people with disabilities can take their own decisions and that they can participate uh, in taking the decisions regarding the collective. And they need to know that they can take uh, the decisions that take them into considerations. And that would be everything. I propose uh, a Ministry of uh, Education, uh, inclusive education, so that we can abort these topics of dis disability. Thank you. Ryan, thank you very much for those uh, insightful remarks. Uh, I think it's incredibly powerful that you point out that the, the barriers to inclusion in digital classrooms are not just about the technology, but also the perceptions. Uh, and I really like the idea of a, of a Ministry of Inclusive Education. Uh, thank you very, very much for your contribution. And next, um, Praveena, it would be great to hear from you from, from your perspective. Uh, how are we doing today? What's, what's the status in, in your eyes of, uh, of um, how well we're, we're creating and supporting inclusive digital classrooms? Uh, greetings, James, and thanks to Ida for giving me the opportunity to share in this discussion. Uh, at the outset, I must stress that the state of inclusion regarding technology in classrooms is unfortunately very different for learners with disabilities living in the global south as compared to learners with disabilities living in the global north. Children with disabilities who were provided with technology support and training have had a better experience in inclusion in the classroom compared to those children without technology. It is recognized that in developing countries, technology has uh, delivered amazing opportunities for children with disabilities, including children with severe and profound disabilities. Too many children in developing countries are not getting the opportunity to learn, and many do not have access to textbooks in accessible alternative formats. This situation can be changed by harnessing low cost devices such as smartphones, tablets, reading devices, etc., that would make information accessible. We therefore need to advocate for the provision and the use of technology to empower learners with disabilities to learn alongside their peers in inclusive classrooms. Acquiring technological skills will not only uh, assist with inclusion in classrooms, but will also provide them with an enabling foundation to, th to thrive in tertiary education, in the world of work and life after school. Technology is undeniably a game changer for learners with disabilities in education. However, technology alone cannot guarantee inclusive, equitable quality education for all as stated in SDG4. There has to be a holistic solution to provide support and inclusion for learners with disabilities according to their particular needs and context. For example, in the case of learners with visual imp impairments, learning how to read and write Braille cannot be replaced with how to, to, with, replaced with how to learn to use technology. Rather, both these skills are important and should complement each other for holistic development. The COVID-19 pandemic resulted in the rapid development and spread of online digital classrooms and distance learning. Digital classrooms created an opportunity for all children, including children with disabilities, to continue with the learning process. Naturally, the quality of teaching and learning differ 
from for every learner depending on where they live, which school they attend, their individual and family circumstances, severity of disability, et cetera. Digital, digital classrooms, however, proved to be somewhat challenging for children with disabilities, and here again, more so for children living in the global south. Some of these included a lack of inclusive planning and universal design for learning in the delivery of alternative platforms and materials, inaccessible media interfaces and instructional, met, instructional methods, uh, no access to technolo technology and devices, poor, poor uh, connection to Wi-Fi, and often poor or no connectivity with electricity. Uh, the other consideration is that certain lessons and concepts cannot be taught through digital platforms, for example, Braille and other con concepts may require tactile explanations for, for, for children with disabilities to be able to understand and grasp certain concepts. For instance, deaf, blind, or visually impaired learners. That being said, however, there are noteworthy and commendable efforts that have been made by various stakeholders to ensure that learners with disabilities and their families were assisted in some way or another through various technology platforms, including social media, online videos, um, websites, etc., to ensure that support and interventions continue. The opportunities presented by digital technology during the pandemic amplifies the promise that technology brings to enhance learning opportunities and possibilities for learners with disabilities. For digital classrooms to be inclusive, every effort must be made to ensure that, that, that virtual learning platforms, online assessments, course materials are available and accessible to children with disabilities to place them on an equal footing as children without disabilities. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that, that you put a, a strong spotlight on the inequities between the global north and the global south when it comes from realizing the potential of, of digital classrooms and technology in the classroom, particularly as, as the digital transformation has accelerated uh, during the pandemic. Um, and, and also recognizing that solutions uh, in, between the global north and the global south may not be um, exactly the same and that technology is not the only solution. There's a lot of other related um, practices like skills developments uh, that, that need to be a part of the solution. So next, I'd like to, to ask uh, Dr. Joseph Murray to share, uh, Joe, your, your perspective on how well we're doing today. Hello, thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel today on a topic which is of close interest to me. The WFD reached out to some of our 131 national members to learn what had worked and not worked during the shift to digital learning during COVID-19, so that going forward, we can think about how to build back better. First, by recognising the shared responsibility of inclusive digital education. This means all stakeholders in inclusive education need to include organisations of deaf people and persons with disabilities at all levels and in all activities, be that from policy and planning to implementation, and from assessment and monitoring to transformation of existing educational systems into quality inclusive education systems. So in building back better, we need to understand what actually happened. Initial reports from the WFD's national organizations of deaf people, as well as our regional networks, show widely varied variable access to digital learning during COVID-19. There were two main barriers, lack of access to technology and lack of access to sign languages. With regard to national sign language access, the biggest gap was not necessarily the global north-global south gap, 
although inequity, inequitable access to technology is a major issue, as has been mentioned. The biggest gap was between signing and non-signing educational environments, regardless of where they were in the world. Those educational settings which, we, which used their national sign language as part of bilingual education were much better prepared for the shift to online teaching. Deaf learners in regular education settings were often left behind in the shift. These learners ended up with little to no sign language access, with teachers unprepared for the needs of deaf learners, and with much digital educational content not even captioned. Our members from around the world in North America and Europe, as well as in Asia and Latin America, all noted the same trend. Deaf learners in regular schools were clearly left behind. In Ghana, learning continued through television learning via a GH Learning TV programme. But in the first month, no content was captioned or interpreted. And this is still an ongoing issue. What interpretation was provided was done by teachers and not professional interpreters. And their, their size on the screen was not compatible with international standards of the size of an interpreter being broadcast on screen, nor was the Ghanaian Association of the Deaf contacted for their input. Thus, Ghanaian sign language was on screen, but the lessons were still not accessible. Teachers in sign language based educational settings struggled with the digital divide, it's fair to say. Reports from our national members showed deaf children, particularly in the global south, had little access to internet at home, lacked access to laptops entirely, or family laptops were given to their hearing siblings, deprioritizing deaf children's education. From Saudi Arabia, we learned that those who had, did have internet access might have weak signals or intermittent signals, particularly those in remote areas, which of course impacted the delivery of educational services in national sign languages. Some teachers, it's worth noting, went to heroic efforts with reports from Indonesia of teachers teaching via one-to-one -one WhatsApp calls and even doing home visits to deaf children during COVID-19. These accounts show the need for reliable data about the impact of COVID-19 on inclusive education, disaggregated by age, sex, and type of disability. Data analysis and reporting should be done in consultation with those on the ground, deaf-led organizations and ODPs to ensure this data accurately reflects the priorities and needs of the people impacted. In order to secure robust civil society participation, we must move forward with digital learning. It is important that organizations of deaf people and indeed ODPs on all levels, be that regional, local, national or global, have the necessary financial and human capacity to be equal partners in these initiatives. The Ghanaian National Association of the Deaf, to take one example, was ready to support telelearning, but their input was not sought in the design process. Inclusion of deaf organisations and OPDs must be properly budgeted for, including access via professional sign language interpreters, to ensure deaf organisations are given the capacity for meaningful participation in designing accessible, digital learning platforms for deaf learners. Thank you very much. Joe, thank you very much for, for really that um, unique perspective across multiple dif different geographies and, and countries. I, I, I really appreciate that. And, and also that last point that you were making about the, the role of civil society and of organizations of people with disabilities I mentioned our DARE index survey and analysis that we do every year. One of the variables that we found be a key determinant of success in a country making progress on the technology aspects of the convention is exactly that, uh, having a strong and robust way for organizations of people with disabilities to participate in the policy making process. So thank you for, for sharing uh, all of those remarks. 
And then uh, finally, I'd like to ask Deanna Stentoff to, to answer the same question. And, and again, from your unique perspective, how are we doing? Thank you very much, uh, James, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, participating in this, I think, very important event. Um, I'm very, it, it, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to join you today. And I'm particularly happy to that we'll be sharing some thoughts on the obstacles and potentials of education of persons with disabilities in a time when education is venturing into a new digital arena. I know, of course, uh, digital education has been around for a while, but it has been extremely um, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Meeting the education system is for many people or persons with disabilities the first major crossroad which will decide a life trajectory. If education is accessible, persons with disabilities have a good chance of succeeding later on as employees, as employers, and as household breadwinners. If, on the other hand, education is not accessible, chances are that persons with disabilities will be left uneducated and dependent on family members, communities, and for those in a privileged position, maybe social services. Article 24, in the CRPD is clear on the right of persons with disabilities to education. This includes the right to education in the digital classroom. There are no exact figures on how many persons are blind and partially sighted in the world. However, estimates suggest the number to be more than 280 million. Of these, many are children who should be in school. Most of these children live in the global south. In 2017, the World Disability Report estimated that less than 10% of blind and partially sighted children had access to schooling. So we were asked to talk about um, in this panel uh, the obstacles, but also maybe the potentials of the digital classroom um, and how the digital classroom could be inclusive. Over the past 10 years, schools have to an increasing extent turned to new digital resources. Educational materials are increasingly developed and delivered through digital media. media sorry. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated this trend and it, many countries moved to fully digital education within a very short period of time. This meant that there were no time to address issues of inaccessibility or develop support mechanisms for those children who struggle to use digital platforms, materials, and meeting facilities. Many education institutions have subsequently decided to continue offering part of their curriculum as digital learning following the pandemic, and so the digital classroom has come to stay. Several surveys have highlighted how children who are blind and partially sighted were left behind in the digital classroom simply because they could not use the digital resources as they were not developed according to the international standards available. Just to give you one um, brief example, um, if a student is to answer an online quiz and can only make an answer by moving the mouse uh, to the right answer, a blind student, student will be left out as he's relying on moving around systematically using the keyboard. Thus, unless the student has a sighted person sitting next to him at all times, he will be excluded from these educational activities. At the same time, he will also be excluded from the interaction, from the collaboration and the socialization that the quiz could generate among participants. No doubt situations as described above will impact learning dramatically and therefore moving into an era of the digital classroom requires careful consideration if blind and partially sighted children are not to be left behind. I'd like to point just to three quick um, areas that need to be taken into consideration at all time if the digital classroom is to be fully inclusive. First of all, digital education is not only the delivery of education within some kind of meeting platform. It's also the platform where the students are intended to find information, find assignments, find um, directions given by the teachers. It is further to this, as Praveena was also talking about, access to books and other educational materials in an accessible format. 
Teachers and teaching assistants need to be training on how to handle issues of inaccessible digital materials in order to ensure learning and inclusion of all students. And then it must be recognized that not all learning can happen digitally. For students who are blind or partially sighted, it's essential they continue be, to be access to learning, for example, of Braille, as also recognized in the CRPD Article 24. Now, just uh, on a final note, I'd like to point to a potential of the digital classroom for students with disabilities. Um, when done right, the digital classroom offers new potentials for ensuring inclusive education, particularly the case in settings where inclusion of students with disabilities in education has traditionally been difficult. 90% of blind and partially sighted children do not have access to school and education, and many of these children live in rural areas where there are no teachers with the necessary skills and training to educate a blind child. Some of these children have been displaced due to war, conflict, natural disasters, or climate change. The digital classroom opens up to these children getting access to education developed specifically for their needs. For example, blind and partially sighted children could gain access to lessons where experiments and visual representations are adequately described and explained. Further to this, teachers and assistants in rural settings with limited access to special education resources could get better support on how to include a blind or partially sighted student into their classroom. For the blind or partially sighted child, access to the digital classroom could in many instances mean the difference between inclusive education close to home versus having to attend special schools, often far removed from family and community. On a final note, I'd like to recognize that the digital classroom also presents some potentials for children and youth um, who end up in uh, displacement in humanitarian disasters, for example, as we see at the moment in, uh, in the war uh, in Ukraine. The digital classroom is certainly a classroom with many potentials but for children and youth with disabilities, um, there are obstacles to be realized. Um, this requires a, uh, um, focus on special education needs in digital classrooms. Um, and it also requires, of course, as Pravina was saying, uh, a focus on access to the devices that will deliver the digital education to the student. On a final note, I would like to stress the importance of including persons with disabilities when designing and implementing new modes of education as only through real collaboration and by listening to the voices of those who rely so much on being included can we ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you for, for your attention. Deanna, thank you so much for, for all of those uh, um, really important points. I'm, I'm glad that you you really emphasize the critical link between education and inclusive education and in, in other outcomes in life like employment and poverty. Uh, and also for making the point about, particularly when we're talking about technology and digital classrooms, the importance of international technical standards uh, and, and being aware of and using those. So uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for as part of this conversation. I have many other questions that I, I would love to ask each of our four speakers. I'd like to thank you all for your leadership and, and your generosity in sharing your time and your expertise. Um, thank you also to the International Disability Alliance for, for convening and executing these important conversations. Um, and I, I hope that all of our participants here today will find these remarks useful and bring them back to your, your homes, your geographies, as we look forward to moving into the future and leveraging technology in a more inclusive way in classrooms. Thank you.
langsung go ahead and start. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone for joining uh, the third session today. My name is Yeni Rosa Damayanti. I'm chair of Indonesian Mental Health Association. Um, and I will be uh, the moderator for this session, the third session, the third panel of, uh, of the Civil Society Forum. Um, uh, I'd like to thank all of the participants who joined today for attending this session. Um, the title of this panel is Intersectionality and Sexual and Reproductive Rights and right, uh, uh, Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights for Persons with uh, Disabilities. Um, this panel will explore challenges and good practices realizing the sexual and reproductive health and rights for persons with disabilities, experiencing multiple forms of discrimination, including women, girl, indigenous persons, sexual orientation, and gender identity diverse and underrepresented disability identities, including specifically person with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, this panel will focus on the experiences of protecting sexual and reproductive health and rights in the communities, including rural communities and communities that are becoming more urban. Uh, we are also going to focus on the barriers to participation, such as stigma, access to information, and attitudinal barriers of healthcare providers as well as example of organization of person with disabilities engagement with the feminist organization. Um, we are going to have a four wonderful speakers today. Um, uh, the first one is, uh, she's very young, she's wonderful, Miss Irene Cuevas, George activist for Argentina. And uh, after that, we are going to have Miss Ana Pelais Narvaez from Spain. She's a member of CIDAO committee. And then we're going to have Maulani Rutin Sulu from Indonesia. She's the uh, advisory board of Indonesian Association of Women with Disabilities. And finally, we will have Ms. Agnieszka Kroll from Polandia, manager program and innovation, CREA. Uh, this panel is going to be 40 minutes. And the first, uh, the first speaker um, uh, is going to be our youngest panelist of all, uh, um, for uh, in for this um, CPL Society Forum, Miss uh, Irene Cuevas. She's still a high school student, as 19 years old with a visual disabilities, motor and hearing loss and epilepsy. This is what she wrote in the, her bio. Uh, since the sixth year of secondary school with a specialization in social sciences and she will graduate uh, this year. She had participated in Lose the Frida, one uh, feminist organization since 2019 and Reconnect Tades since 20, uh, 2021. Um, she worked for the recognition of the rights of persons with disabilities to make visible the situation uh, um, that happens to us and how we feel about that. Um, is going to talk about the current situation of women with disabilities in Argentina in relation to their sexual and reproductive rights. And she's also going to talk about her work with Luz de Frida to promote their rights and prevent the violation of uh, women with disabilities. So, Anna, yes. are you here? The floor is yours. Irene. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Irene. Ir, uh, Irene, Irene, I'm sorry. Irene, are you there? If Irene is not there yet, um, uh, we are going to start with, uh, I'm sorry, we are going to start with Anna. I'm sorry, uh, I think uh, we should start with Anna first. Um, Anna, Anna uh, Pelais Narvaez from Spain, uh, uh, who has been a member of UN Community for Elimination of Discrimination Against Women from 2019. And in 2021, she has been elected as one of the vice president of CIDA Committee for the period of 2020 and 2022. 
and before that from 2009 until 2016, she was a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, of which she has been the vice president. Um, Anna, the floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias. Es un honor para mí estar aquí con, con todos vosotros. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be uh, here with you. I'm from Geneva. Uh, it's an honor for me to participate uh, to this in this event that you have organized. I'm going to thank uh, to uh, International Disability Alliance because uh, thanks to them, uh, we are having uh, uh, sign language interpretation. So I'm uh, very happy to um, really show my gratitude uh, we can say that there are a lot of uh, discrimination uh, when it comes to women. Uh, we have a lot of negative stereotypes uh, when it comes to uh, this capacity and uh, other uh, factors. There are two factors, uh, women and girls with disabilities. They uh, suffer um, ill uh, treatment and that uh, has a very um, bad consequence on their um, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, women and girls with uh, discapacities, um, they are considered as hypersexual, sexual, uh, as that they are not um, the, able to be mothers and they're not able to uh, uh, share their life with someone, to live with someone with their partner. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of discrimination from, from part of their from other from part of other professionals. Um, uh, for example, y el incest, el incesto son tan solo algunos ejemplos de las violaciones de derechos que padecen muchas mujeres y niñas con discapacidad en todo el mundo, eh, sin dar su consentimiento o sin entender completamente las consecuencias de estos actos. Las mujeres y niñas con discapacidad eh, eh, que tienen altas necesidades de apoyo or, for example, uh, las mujeres con discapacidad. Women and girls with discapacities, with multiple discapacities, uh, women that have barriers to to communicate with other people, uh, women that are in some institutions, and, uh, and women, women and which uh, are girls under guardian, are guardians because of restriction of their legal are capacities, they are in a situation of major vulnerability and uh, exposition to uh, uh, act, abusive acts and uh, violations of uh, the human rights. Women and uh, girls with disabilities, they receive their formation uh, of their uh, sexual and reproductive health very rarely, and they don't have education regarding uh, uh, family planification, and they don't, don't have education on how to recognize uh, any forms of violations such as uh, the OBGYN violence. Uh, they don't know uh, for help that they can get uh, on the exercise of maternity. And I can also say that uh, with uh, in the name of this women, they also have barriers for exceeding of programs of uh, OBG1 health, uh, especially when regarding to uh, cancer of mama or the uterus cancer. There's also sensibility, uh, lack of sensibilis sensibilization and lack of uh, information in the families uh, of these women, uh, the girl, these girls, and uh, among the people which offer the professional services, which give uh, sanitary uh, help which uh, work with uh, education or judicial power. These uh, people, uh, uh, these 
they're not inclusive or accessible and they're not uh, secure for people with a disability. Uh, the institution have very little number of uh, devices uh, for helping these uh, women of uh, with uh, with women with disability to help and to assist to women with disabilities and they're not prepared uh, in consequence everything uh, all of this uh, provokes that from the childhood, women and girls with disabilities have uh, major, uh, they're, may, they're in bigger risk to, uh, to be victims of violence, of not, not wanted, uh, not wanted pregnancies and in consequences, these uh, problems uh, happen uh, within persons very proximate to these peoples. So what can we do? We have to work with all of the norms, internationals. There, are, uh, there is jurisprudence, which is uh, enough. We have, in, uh, we have uh, a lot of different um, articles and laws, but there, is, there isn't a real harmonization when it comes of the rights and the health, uh, reproductive health with women uh, and among the politics of the states. In the other uh, place, it is very uh, important to uh, recognize the, the bad practices, which I have already commented. The unwanted um, pregnancies, the violent abortions, which uh, still are not recognized like that. So we have to fight uh, against the the persistent of uh, legal practices in different uh, states uh, fight against the persistence in negation in negation of these practices as not bad. In fourth place, we need to make sure that the, that legal that legal mechanism exists and that women. Uh, be that women have reparation for this uh, damages they suffered. So we have to uh, gather the data and the statistics uh, regarding the separation regarding the sex and all of the rights when when it comes to the reproductive health and their rights and we need special attention to the necessity of helping the victims, which is fundamental. It is necessary to help the victims to, uh, to help the women um, and recognize and help them also materially uh, to all the women which suffer uh, in regards of the, uh, the problems of sexual and reproductive health, especially in the time of pandemic, because we know that there are, um, that there are violations of their, their rights, uh, which have uh, enlarged and women with disabilities uh, await the responses that uh, states want to uh, give. This is everything that I wanted to say for my first intervention. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, that's a very, very uh, interesting uh, speech. Uh, uh, gracias, I, Anna. I really like that you uh, mentioned about the women under guardianship as well as women in the institution because as a person with psychosocial disabilities myself, this is uh, the issue that I think is uh, not yet enough, you know, uh, raised uh, uh, around uh, women movement or women uh, or disability movement. And frankly, I I really glad that we have one of the CEDAW committee here. I always curious of the issue of disability, whether it has ever been a topic. A disc of discussion in CEDAW committee, then I, uh, from your presentation, I, th uh, I, I guess that it does a topic within the CEDAW committee. So thank you very much. Well, our next speaker is uh, Maulani uh, Rotinsulu from Indonesia. 
Is Malani is ready here? Hello, Yeni. Hi, how Malani. Are how are you? Good evening yeah. from Jakarta. So, um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the the AIDA and the COSP. Uh, 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 sorry, COSP. Uh, uh, I mean, the uh, implementer relating to relating to the bringing the issue of the intersectionality and uh, also reproductive health, and then uh, invited us. Uh, one of us is me from Indonesia talking about uh, the uh, reproductive health. And secondly, I would like to thank to of course the International Disability Alliance and also Disability Rights Funds who uh, make uh, the works of uh, the organization of person with disability in Indonesia become um, more seen to the in, into the global uh, movement. And then we can bring also uh, uh, bring uh, several uh, success, successful in uh, relating to the uh, policy and regulations. Uh, to uh, to be to be accounted by the government. So, uh, Ibu Yeni, so uh, I was I I was uh, asked to talk about the reproductive health. Is it? Yeah. Yes, I that's right. I'm, but probably um, it's better if you can introduce yourself and your organization first. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Thank you so much. So I'm. I, I am the advisory chief board uh, from in Indonesian Association of Women with Disabilities. Uh, unfortunately, the organization of women with disabilities, it is only one organization of women with disabilities in Indonesia that I think it must be a lot who are coming uh, for uh, a lot of DPOs coming to to talk about women with disabilities, yeah. So uh, the, uh, the the Indonesian Association of Women with Disabilities, um, one of the member from the National Coalition uh, Working Group and a working group on um, on the implementation on the right of person with disability. So including one of the organization is also the member is also. Miss Yeni uh, organization, Indonesian Mental Health Association. So uh, we work uh, closely uh, inside of inside of the the coalition as well as uh, work closely with government as well. Uh, when I talk uh, relating to the government, it means we advocate governments, something like that. <laughs> so uh, uh, first of all, uh, relating to the reproductive health, uh, if I I would like to share relating to the what we found our findings in the um, local levels. Uh, we have several uh, several assessment and also uh, research uh, relating to the reproductive health and how children and women with disabilities, uh, 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 including uh, girls with disabilities, live uh, within the family, and then uh, we would like to uh, portray the, their reproductive health. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, reproductive health uh, education for teenagers and early detection uh, to prevent mother and baby mortality and to prevent disability are very lacking in Indonesia. This is uh, our findings when we do assessment in 2000, uh, 2020. And then this, this is due to the fact that uh, reproduction issue are still considered taboo in the eyes of the government and uh, the society. Most persons with disabilities still do not understand how to keep their reproductive organs healthy. In fact, most government personnel are equally clueless when it comes to contraceptive and administer contraceptives to a wide number of people without consent and without giving information to women and children with disability who live in care homes and go to special schools on ground of preventing unwanted pregnancy. So this is um, 
uh, the statement that I would like uh, to inform you that um, we cannot deny when women and girls with disability lack of knowledge on their sexual reproductive health, they are living in the age of dangerous, either relating to the, their hygiene as well as uh, violent and sexual. So uh, in my country, we did uh, some uh, assistances to, um, I think this is, uh, for me, this is a lot of number of uh, sexual violence uh, relating uh, the lack of knowledge of a person with disability itself, the girls with disability itself. They do not know that they are treated un, uh, unfair relating to, uh, relating to the uh, violence, yeah, violence, sexual violence. They do not know that they are already in, in sight of the sexual violence um, situation. So, uh, so uh, for according to the HWDI or the Indonesian Association, Association with Disabilities, the education for sexual health and reproductive uh, it's very, very crucial. Uh, it is very important that uh, the inter intervention first intervention is coming to the girls or the children with disability relating to the sexual and reproductive health educations. Uh, this is what we found um, uh, in, a, in the level of uh, villages and also municipalities. So uh, Miss Yeni, this is our, this is my first, um, forward relating to uh, next uh, uh, discussion relating in, in this uh, program. So I give uh, to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maulani. Uh, I, I got one of a quite um, interesting point from you, which is talking about reproductive rights or reproductive issues. Uh, especially uh, for uh, women with disabilities is still considered as a taboo in Indonesia. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, one of the challenge that we have, we face in Indonesia um, because of the, uh, you know, the religious belief um, saying that talking about sexuality openly is not something, you know, proper to do. So yes. yeah, this is one of the challenges. Um, um, adding my, uh, you know, my concern also were forced contraception and forced sterilization also quite common actually in Indonesia, especially for women with psychosocial disabilities, because people still uh, consider that it is normal, that it is okay for women, especially with um, intellectual disabilities and psychosocial disabilities, to be right. Uh, sterilized, right? Then <laughs> yes. uh, we have uh, we have experience on advocating uh, people, uh, including the what is it, what, what we call the organization, the movement. Uh, uh, I mean, the actors of uh, human rights. Relating to on how to see uh, the equal, uh, I mean the the rights uh, to be, uh, I mean the to be free from uh, forced sterilization as well as uh, forced contraceptions for yes. uh, women and girls uh, with uh, psychosocial disabilities. So together with all organization of uh, person with disabilities, we do we do advocate to the bill of the, uh, the uh, to the bill of uh, sexual violence yeah anti sexual violence yes yeah sexual violence yeah <laughs> the bill of sexual violence before 2022 because in yeah. 2022 we uh, succeed in uh, advocate the, by by erasing the the draft of uh, or deleted the draft the uh, the Sorry, the draft is, uh, I mean, the article uh, inside of the draft, uh, I mean, the bill of the sexual violence relating to the discrimination on uh, children with children with psychosocial with disability 
by I mean uh, from the from the perspective of uh, thinking that uh, uh, disability psychosocial disability is out of women <laughs> as yes. general. So yeah. they they treat a person with disability. Uh, particularly uh, psychosocial and intellectual disability as not part of women as general. So this is kind of a long journey, maybe two or three years advocating to the, to the like um, um, official uh, organization <laughs> uh, and also yeah. official organization of human rights as well. Yes. So yeah, that, thank yeah. you, Maulani. Yes, I remember you. that's uh, the fight that we fought together, and yes, uh, it's very, course. very interesting and very, very memorable. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much. So, thank you very much for your. Thank you. Thank for you your, really. for your uh, speech. Um, <laughs> next, we are going to have. Uh, we are we are going to have. Agnesia, uh, sorry, Agnieszka Kroll. I'm sorry if I do not, uh, uh, um, you know, pronounce your no, uh, name right. Uh, Agnesia, she's a manager in programs and innovation at CRIA, specifically in the disability and sexuality portfolio. CRIA is a feminist organization that, among others, works to expand sexual and reproductive freedoms and advances the human rights of structurally excluded people. CRIA co cooperates strongly with disability rights activists and organizations led by women with disabilities to amplify their perspective in feminist movement. Agnieszka Kroll is also a sociologist and her PhD research focuses on reproductive rights and experience of women with disabilities. So Agnieszka, how women organizations can play a role in bridging the movements and advocating for sexual reproductive health rights for persons with disabilities? The floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Yeni Rosa. You can hear me well, right? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, it's my really, it's really my privilege to speak today at uh, the COSP Civil Society Forum. And thank you, a uh, big thank you to the organizers for um, organizing such an important discussion and also to the previous speakers for really bringing up um, the key and crucial uh, discussions that are happening when it comes to SRHR and uh, disability. So uh, as a person working in a feminist organization, I'm going to speak uh, from this point to like what is the role of feminist organizations in also advocating for the uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, of persons with um, disabilities. Um, so as um, at CRIA, we really do believe that uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights are central to the well-being and to the realization of human rights of uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, issues related to reproduction and sexuality uh, are present in one form or another across the lifespan of persons with diverse disabilities, mm -hmm. yet we all know that they continue to encounter ableist prejudices and also structural discrimination when it comes to exercising sexual uh, and reproductive rights. Uh, and this is despite the continuous efforts and really years of advocacy of many persons with disabilities, especially women with disabilities, who are activists and academics who have mm. led uh, these discussions and who, ha who have also taught us how to advocate to address uh, issues at the intersection of gender, uh, sexuality and disability. And um, despite these efforts, uh, it seems that SRHR issues of persons with disabilities are still not given the needed attention across mm. uh, diverse social movements. Mm. Um, and I think this focus on intersectionality on this panel is very important as it really reminds us that in order to exercise sexual and reproductive rights and freedoms, mm. we need to look at structural discrimination and how disability justice mm. is really interconnected with other uh, uh, aspects such as race, indigenous origin, caste, class, uh, age, rural urban divide, uh, refugee status, among others. Um, and I think it's uh, very crucial for us also uh, to deepen our understanding and support uh, also at the intersection of sexual and gender diversity, intersex rights and, uh, and disability justice. And precisely this diversity within the disability community uh, is why uh, cross-movement cooperation uh, is so crucial 
uh, for ensuring uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights for persons with disabilities, especially who face multiple discrimination. And for instance, uh, in-depth cross-movement cooperation uh, to amplify the advocacy priorities of persons with disabilities who belong also to LGBTI communities is very important, in particular where um, in cases where the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex persons are not recognized or where the community faces criminalization. Um, and uh, as feminist organization um, working on SRHR, uh, we really have also learned from feminists with disabilities how interconnected uh, other rights issues are to um, realizing SRHR. For example, uh, the Article 12 of the CRPD on legal capacity is how, how, to how much this article is really shaping uh, whose consent matters. Uh, or the Article 19 of the CRPD on independent living, showing how the institutionalization is really related to decision making in relation to sexuality and reproduction also. Um, and reiterating uh, what Anna Pelaez has, has, uh, has shared uh, also while uh, talking uh, about legal capacity and the, and the institutionalization, we really need to highlight that decision making, uh, consent, centering consent and living independently are very much feminist issues. Um, um, and I think uh, for organizations working at the SRHR on, the, uh, on uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, it's really important uh, to rethink and reshape the agendas uh, to center the priorities and considerations of persons with disabilities. And this should really uh, include stronger focus on addressing the uh, and uh, addressing and preventing enforced and coerced practices such as uh, enforced sterilizations and abortions. Uh, it should also include centering consent uh, by persons with disabilities. Uh, to ensure that persons, especially women with disabilities, can make decisions about own sexuality and reproduction within supporting communities. Uh, it also means ensuring access to medical information about health and body related to contraception and pregnancy that is unbiased and not ableist. Uh, it also means extending support for parents with disabilities um, to live independently in the communities, as well as ensuring, of course, accessible uh, sexual education that, uh, in fact, centers disability perspectives. Um, because we really hear from our colleagues about perv pervasive withdrawal of information about own reproductive and sexual health and rights, uh, as well as a lot on sexual violence, of course. Um, our uh, experience in uh, organizing the annual Disability, Sexuality and Rights Online Institute uh, is that we really learned that there is like a great need and willingness uh, among uh, a lot of organizations that are not working primarily in disability rights to really uh, learn how to reframe on own practices and how to support persons with disabilities. And beyond uh, education and beyond having those mutual dialogues, uh, cross-movement dialogues, we are also on the fault lines uh, between the movements. We also need uh, more finding to secure SRHR rights of persons with disabilities. Um, and my last point uh, relates, um, in fact, to this uh, role, like the key role, um, as, we, as we see it, of the feminist organizations that is really to amplify the, that the perspectives and priorities from within disability rights and disability justice movements um, to ensure that disability rights are central to embracing SRHR, uh, but also um, in diverse other social movements, as, as we see the intersectionality so crucial for realizing um, SRHR. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. A very interesting speech. Uh, I got some of the very uh, uh, important point on your speech about uh, the intersection of gender, sexuality, and disability, and how cross movement are crucial. Um, you know, um, in uh, raising this issue. Um, and uh, the last one that I really happy to hear that you recognize how Article 12 uh, uh, on, um, on legal capacity really uh, reflect or really show that how consent matter 
also I really appreciate that you mentioned also Article uh, 19 about the institutionalization that makes women with disabilities very very vulnerable in this issue, and uh, I I cannot um, you know say enough thank to you to say that uh, institutionalization and legal capacity rights to legal capacity is uh, are feminist issues. This is really make uh, you know make me very very happy because actually uh, right now. There is still a gap between um, women movement in general, not Korea, of course, uh, with uh, women with disabilities. Um, I think uh, you are. Um, we are going to have uh, the last, uh, the last uh, uh, speaker. Uh, Irene, is she here? Are you here? If not yet, then uh, I will have one question that I hope all the speakers can answer. Oh, are you uh, going to uh, speak on behalf of Irene, Luciana? Hola, yo soy eh, acompañante de, de Irene. Eh, aún ella no ha llegado, pero... Hello, I'm with Irene. Uh, she hasn't arrived yet. So if she does drive, I will be speak on her behalf. Uh, yeah, Irene is not yet arrived. And since we really tight in time, can you please um, uh, talk on her behalf? I, I already introduced Luz, uh, uh, um, uh, Irene at the first, you know, in, um, when I started the, the session, so you can go ahead and talk. Bien. Eh, nosotros... Very well, we wanted, or Irene wanted to talk about uh, the problems that we, uh, persons with disabilities, have to, uh, in order to fulfill our sexual and reproductive health rights. Uh, let me, uh, give me just a moment. She has sent her questions, but, and she yeah, said that she will be in a second with us. Okay. So if you want, you can continue with that and we can go on. Uh, yeah, I think you can. Um, I, I have a question for Irene that probably you can answer for all of us. Um, is it about the current situation of women with disabilities in Argentina in relation to their sexual and reproductive rights, as well as how do you work at Luz de Frida to promote the rights and prevent the violation of the rights of women with disabilities in Argentina? I think that's two of the questions that we would like to hear uh, the answer from uh, Irene or uh, from you. Bien. Nosotros... Very well. Uh, we from our project, new project, uh, Luz de Frida, Frida's uh, Light, uh, which began uh, um, last year in the pandemic, we saw that uh, our position needs to be saw, uh, seen and uh, listened, and we were talking a lot about the position of women and their rights. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. No problem. So there are many breaches and what's happened when women want to um, use their rights and make use of them. In reality, I will talk a, a lot about, uh, about it globally. Irene will talk about Argentina. Uh, so do women with Young women with this, this disability, uh, we are still uh, a lot back with, when, uh, with our rights. So what do we want? We have a population which is very far off the center of how can we educate uh, that women. So in Luz de Frida, we try to visit, make 
the, these uh, things visible to shed light on them, uh, we, which we have uh, a great debt to. So I think uh, that, uh, so I'm sorry, I think Irene will connect right now so she can continue with this intervention. I'm sorry, she still hasn't arrived. So I was telling, I'm sorry, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very nervous. So can somebody, can you please help me, Yeni, with my yes. intervention? Yeah. So uh, probably you can tell us about your work with Luz de Frida. What is Luz de Frida and uh, what, what do you work? Very well. We began and we tried to take the voice of women uh, to those topics which are still obscure when it comes to the uh, reproductive health. So we are working uh, on a guide of menstrual health where we try to uh, make accessible material which can be under understood by women, uh, young women with disability because we think they're not, uh, there is not a material which is accessible to those women. So we are trying to create a, a real impact that this material can be used later for those women, but also uh, that uh, people, professionals uh, in health department can use it because sometimes uh, professionals in, uh, in health professionals, doctors, when they come around uh, women with disabilities, they are full of prejudice and they don't know how to work with people with uh, women with uh, disabilities and without their knowledge that becomes a, a breach of, um, so, it, so no one uh, keeps asking us what's happened, what happens with our, our position. And um, every time everyone consults the family and uh, of, of the family of the people, of the women with disability and not the women herself. So uh, the women, the women's voice uh, isn't always hers. We are not, seen as women so mm. our consults always go through the families and not to us as families so the doctors make exclusion and they exclude us even though they don't want to so what we want uh, with this guide of menstrual management uh, we want to uh, enter and to get to women with disabilities and to their families so that those women can have uh, a tool uh, with what to work with, to uh, have information and to make a path towards um, an accessible uh, piece, piece of information. And uh, um, parting from that, we work on different topics, uh, on different um, workshops and we are trying to empower uh, between pairs. Uh, we try to empower uh, different women which still don't know about Luz de Fridas as uh, a collective. What we uh, try to propose in Luz de Frida is to give um, a, a look with perspective of uh, women with dis uh, disabilities uh, to the feminism, which is uh, which is lacking today in Latin America. Our, our pairs still don't know how to, how, how can they include themselves uh, in this feminism? So uh, we need to think that through Include, including in the uh, feminist movement, including the topics of the health, and not only sexual, sexual health, but also the access to our rights of uh, our sexual and reproductive rights, which need to be accessible, the, which need to create uh, conditions so that we can 
um, so we can use our uh, rights of sexual and reproductive health. And not only those one, th those ones, but also uh, different um, rights. Okay, thank you, Luciana. That's perfect. That's wonderful. I got. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, that's a really really good. Uh, I see that uh, we have some common common theme here, in which that many, uh, including uh, medical service provider, who do not see us as women, and they. Uh, instead of consult with us, they consult with uh, with our families, and I'm very, I, I appreciate that Luz de Frida is a feminist with disability movement consists of young activists such as you and uh, Irene. So uh, it's really remarkable. Thank you very much for your time. Um, yeah, so we have uh, finished to hear all of uh, four. Uh, um, um, uh, for for uh, great uh, speakers, and um, uh, we have uh, run out of time actually, and uh, uh, we do not have time for uh, uh, for questions. So, but I think uh, the whole speakers already really uh, give a very very strong message and uh, explanation that we can uh, um, you know take with ourselves in our movement in the future. So thank you very much for all the speakers for a wonderful speech tonight. Oh, sorry, tonight in Indonesia in the morning and afternoon in the, uh, everywhere uh, in different, different part of the world. So yeah, um, uh, now uh, it's finished this session and uh, I uh, uh, give it back to Hawa. Over to you, Hawa. Thank you very much, Yeni. That was such an inspiring session, very insightful as well. Um, now we've come to the last session of the day, and I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Ombati for this particular session. And uh, in this session, uh, Elizabeth will be shedding light on the week ahead, and um, this will be the closing session focus. Elizabeth Ombati, is a DPO engagement officer with the African Disability Forum, a member of the International Disability Alliance, which is an inclusive futures partner. She's a disability rights self-advocate and a member of USP Kenya, which works to promote and advance the rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities. Elizabeth? Um, thank you so much, Hawa. I believe I can be seen because it's dark here <laughs> so um thank you so much i as, okay <laughs> okay so as um how has introduced me i'm a woman with a sexual disability and also important to also mention that i uh, i'm a member of transforming communities for inclusion um so as the conference of states parties um begins tomorrow i'm going to highlight key concepts taken off um, these very vibrant discussions we've had for the past few hours in the civil society forum. Our discussions have been based on three key themes. Um, so the first one has been taking advantage of opportunities to move forward on the, the institutionalization. We've also talked about um, knowledge sharing for inclusive education in digital classrooms. And lastly, we've um, had the session around intersectionality and sexual and reproductive health and rights for persons with disabilities. So what are the priorities that um, we are proposing then to take forward um, to the Conference of States Parties um, from our civil society forum? And so as you may be aware, the overarching theme of course is building disability inclusive and participatory societies in the COVID context and beyond. There are three main themes that will be considered for the three days. Um, so the first one is innovation and technology advancing disability rights. There'll be um, a session around economic empowerment and entrepreneurship of persons with disabilities. And then there will be um, another thematic on participation of persons with disabilities in climate action, disaster risk reduction and resilience against natural disasters. 
So I'm attempting to bring then a summary of the key priorities that um, have been put forward, um, a focus that we can focus on in course following the discussions that we've had today. So I think the idea then is that when um, the conference is going on with the specific discussions that we may have these key ideas as priorities that uh, we can put a focus on and I'm going to list them. So we've had a lot around legal harmonization that was spoken about when we talked about the institutionalization, uh, which is very key. So when we're speaking about laws in countries that are not compliant um, with the CRPD, so we've heard about denial of legal capacity, for example, women and girls under guardianship, laws that still advocate for force and coercion, among others. So really important to consider these um, specific um, laws that as we talk about legal harmonization, then this is something that we can consider when discussions are ongoing. Another point that I've picked um, is on the lack of implementation of policies. This was mentioned um, when we we're talking about inclusive education, but then also looking at broadly as lack of implementation of a diversity of laws and policies, you know, that secure community inclusion of persons with disabilities. So it's really looking at um, policies that are not implemented in various uh, spheres, not only just in um, education, but also looking at um, employment, for example, or around social protection. So that is something else that I picked, um, the lack of implementation of policies, something that we can also have in focus as the discussions for course are going on. The third one was around accessibility of information or lack of access to information across thematics. For example, it could be on sexual productive health, your presenter spoke about the digital divide that exists between different geographical regions that was also mentioned. Um, so that is a focus. So the focus on technology in this era, when we're also looking in COSP at technology as advancing rights of persons with disabilities in different spheres. So important to also have in mind this digital divide, but also the, the lack of access to information, but also in terms of accessibility to this information, how is it being accessed? The other important thematic that I've also picked is um, nothing without us, um, something that really continuously came up. Nothing without us, the need for full and effective participation of organizations of persons with disabilities, involvement of persons with disabilities in inclusive education, in work and employment, in policies and provisions around climate action. So very important um, focus that has to be also put a focus on as um, discussions uh, during COSP uh, go on. Another point was on data and statistics, disaggregated data across a, a diversity of issues. And um, so to be able to really have this disaggregation, to be able to see the situation uh, of persons with disabilities in the different uh, thematics that will be discussed. So aggregation of data, very important, um, that kept coming up also in the discussions today. The last three points. So one was the need to engage diff, um, underrepresented groups, also cut across discussions. And there was the emphasis around solidarity of the cross-disability movement to carry along um, specific issues that may be raised by underrepresented groups. So it's not really just the underrepresented groups um, carrying forth these discussions, but then the solidarity um, within the cross-disability movements on such issues. The other one also that we have to be cognizant of as COSP goes on is in terms of the many barriers that are experienced. So it, the, the barriers that impede the inclusion of persons with disabilities and attitudes and perceptions uh, were also raised. So very important to keep um, focus also on these barriers as um, this discussion starts tomorrow. So to be able to highlight on the different barriers uh, listed and um, ways in which these barriers can be addressed. 
And lastly, so the, the point I've picked is on the need to look at intersectionalities, which has been um, said uh, in the last um, session. So focusing on structural discrimination as affects people at the intersection of many identities. So it can be age, sexuality, stability, geographic or reach, for example. So very important that as discussions are ongoing to also have that key aspect of intersections that if, if it's about economic empowerment, how are these, how is it affecting, you know, people with disabilities in the different identities that they have? So if it's about technology advancing rights of persons with disabilities, to also be able to have uh, the discussions around intersections. So that is a bit of summary that I've been able to put together. So my apologies if I missed some other key themes, but really to remember that these are some of the very key um, focus areas that we will keep in mind as course goes on um, from tomorrow. So thank you so much and back to you, Hawa. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. You said that was a summary. I feel like that was very exhaustive. Thank you so much. At this point, I would love to thank all the speakers for such rich contributions and enlightenment and just shining a light on cost 15 um, topics and segments and you know all of the different um, aspects to which different topics affect people with disabilities. I especially want to thank the interpreters for the work done so far, um, very commendable work and uh, for ensuring that this is an inclusive uh, meeting of all of us here today. And I wish everyone um, a great cost 15 going ahead into the week. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, International Disability Alliance and all the partners. Thank you very much. <laughs>